Russell, how you doing, man? I'm I'm glad you're here. Steve, so excited to see you today. Thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we we had a fun conversation that people will listen to later. And um now we're gonna have maybe a more serious conversation. Uh I want to talk to you about finances. Womp womp. Yeah, that's Aww. like there's just so many sound effects that go so many. after I want to talk to you about your finances. Yeah, man. But that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you're you're setting the bar such that I I have to hype this up big time when I when I come in strong. Well, well, let's first let's switch spaces because I feel I feel better when I'm more like Jimmy Fallon and I'm on the right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I wish I had like a, a celebrity next to me, like Lionel Richie or something to make this really interesting. But that, you know, do that's again. why I've got you. You're the celebrity, Russell. Oh, ooh. Ooh, ooh. So, <laughs> all right. So uh, I'm going to hype it up for you because I want, I want to kind of set uh, what, what's the, what's the right word? I want to kind of set some parameters around our conversation. So first, can you just give us like a couple minute quick overview who you are, your company, like why on earth are you doing something so awful? Like finances? Yeah, of course I can. Yeah. My name is Russell Benaroya. I own a company called Stride Services. I acquired this company with a business partner about three and a half years ago to help high growth business owners get better control of their back office finances so they can spend more time making better business decisions. Why on earth would I get hyped and excited about that? Well, a couple of reasons. One, I have a background in finance and spent many years in corporate finance in New York and then in private equity. And so I've been steeped in a bit of the finance discipline and I see the benefits of really understanding the language of numbers. Uh, so that's number one. Number two, uh, I am also an entrepreneur. So prior to Stride, I had built and subsequently exited two different businesses, both in healthcare. And I have seen the value when an entrepreneur can focus on the very few things that they can do uniquely to grow the business without getting drawn into the back office, which is not an area where entrepreneurs typically get a lot of energy, but the information there can be rich. And so we wanted to create a service that really professionalized the method of how we do that accounting work and how we do that strategic financial advising to help them use information to grow the company that they dreamed of when they started. You know, that's actually a really awesome reason, man. Hmm. I commend you. Gets you up in the morning and it's exciting to live in a world where you want to help people achieve their highest and best use. And oh, by the way, we do bookkeeping accounting, but it's, it's for a reason. And that makes for a different kind of culture Good. that we build and a different kind of relationship with our clients. Okay. So one, one thing that I'd, I'd like for us to discuss, no, not one thing, the thing that I would like for us to discuss is let's set some parameters here. I want, hey buddy, <laughs> I want to help MSPs that are today doing less than 500,000 a year. And the reason I wanna do that is because those MSPs um, probably are, three employees or fewer. In fact, I would honestly say most MSPs are still doing less than 200,000 because there's a lot of, of, you know, little guys, there's a lot of uh, sole proprietors and, and one man shows. 
Um, and then, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the bigger MSPs and even the bigger one man shows will, uh, call them, you know, trunk slammers and pizza delivery techs. And sure, there are some guys who they're just looking to make a quick buck. Okay. But I want to help the ones that actually are trying to grow a legitimate, uh, successful MSP. So let's, let's talk about some things that a smaller MSP can and should be doing so that they can make better financial decisions to set them up for success. That way, uh, maybe they're more profitable and they can say, you know, I've, I've gotten it this far. And thanks to Russell, I'm able to do some pretty okay things, but I think he could take me even further. I just need to hire this guy to, to do it all. So obviously, you know, your goal is to, you know, acquire new clients because you are a for-profit business. Uh, but I also know that today you want to help and educate people uh, so that way they're, they're doing better. Great. Go. So let's let's uh, hey, share your screen. I'm let's let's do some P and L reports and <laughs> statements. <laughs> yes, here's what here's uh, the, the, your setup is is terrific. So let me let me arrange this response in uh, a, dig a digestible manner without trying to make anybody a finance and accounting wizard. Okay, which is not the idea. The idea, by the way, is to better aid that small MSP owner to know what are the questions that they want to be asking of their information to help them make better business decisions. It, so often it is the lack of understanding. I don't know what to, I don't, I don't really know what questions to ask. What am I looking for? What am I looking at? So let's unpack that and how to architect your structure to be able to answer those questions. Let me start here. The first is for, for all businesses, but very acutely for emerging businesses, the metric, the financial metric that really is most important to understand is something called your gross profit. Okay. Uh, what is gross profit? You may know what gross profit is. Gross profit is your revenue minus the direct costs that are associated with generating that revenue. For an MSP, what are those primary direct costs typically? Labor. Labor, right? The gross profit is a indication of whether or not the thing that you sell in the market standalone has profit, is profitable. We call it the intrinsic value of the business that you've created. For example, if I sell something to you, Steve, for $5, but it costs me $10 to sell you that $5 thing, intrinsically, one might say, that's not a sustainable business, right? Okay. Well, that's like your opinion, man. I, I, I suppose it depends <laughs> on what universe you're operating in, but okay. Now, below that gross profit line is the apparatus, the business infrastructure that you are building to support that thing you call a gross profit, the, the thing that you sell minus the direct costs associated with selling it. So what are the, what's the apparatus? The apparatus is things like, oh, I've got marketing expense and I've got some executive salaries and, oh, I've, I've got insurance and maybe I have some rent to pay and I, I have some travel expense, right? Those are the, what we call overhead expenses. But at the core, as a business owner, you want to know, am I optimizing that gross profit. Okay. So cool. How do I do that? Well, gross profit is really a function of revenue and costs. So what are your primary costs? Your primary costs are labor and labor utilization. 
So then what you're really interested in as an emerging MSP, but frankly, any size MSP is how well am I managing my labor costs associated with the revenue that I'm generating on a per customer basis? If I understand as a business owner, whether or not customer A versus customer B versus customer C is profitable and at what level, because I know their gross profit, which we'll talk about how to get there in a second, then I, as a business owner, have now the keys to the castle of understanding the most important lever in my business. Am I priced correctly? Am I incurring too much costs for this service? Do I need to go to that client and course correct this relationship? Imagine the possibilities and decisions when you get down to that level. How do you get to that level? One of the pieces of advice I would strongly encourage is that you take the time to get your PSA, ConnectWise, Autotask, whatever you're using, set up correctly. And the process is set up correctly for how you are managing your agreements and your labor in your PSA so that the reports that output from there give you that information. Let me summarize. Know your gross profit, set up your PSA correctly. And then the third is make sure that the chart of accounts, chart of accounts being the financial statement that you review on a monthly basis, sufficiently separates the different lines of business that you have so that you can look glanceably quickly and say, oh, I see my, my hardware business only is generating a 20% profit margin. My managed services is at a 65% and my project and time and materials is a 35% margin. Well, you would only know that if you set up your account structure in a way so that your revenue and costs were, su were, were uh, successfully mapping to those chart of accounts. And what we find with so many clients is in the race to just get going in business and the entropy of setting up the back office, they get to it, they want to get to it later. And then it's a complete mess. And the amount of time and money spent to rework it is significant and time consuming that they're already meaningfully behind the eight ball in terms of continuing to grow with confidence. Gross profit, customer level profitability, chart of account setup man and management. So I want to I want to ask some questions about the gross profit. You said labor is like the thing that we worry about when it comes to uh, the cost of delivering this service. But I argue as an MSP that you know we're also selling uh, I, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna rattle off. We're also yeah. selling them, you know, Microsoft licensing, antivirus, DNS filtering, uh, EDR, and uh, just all of this different stuff, right? And and so it's it it can become overwhelming because we really do have like I I know one guy he's got. 26 SKUs for for like all of the things that he's selling it blows my mind um that we have come to a point where there's like you know six or seven different agents that we're installing onto an endpoint uh you know because we've got we've got the customer experience thing so maybe you're using uh I can't think of the one I want to think of. Cloud Radial, mm -hmm. uh, you've got your RMM agent, you've got your DNS agent, uh, you've got, um, we'll say you've got Defender and Huntress, and let's say maybe you're also, for some reason, using like a, 
Blackpoint Cyber or, or some other type of security tool. And I'm sorry, guys, I know I'm probably mixing and matching things that shouldn't get mixed and matched. Um, but I also haven't been using all of these tools lately. So please show me a little bit of grace. Uh, but then you might also have total because it's a remote user and you need them to have, you know, so there's just all this stuff. So it's not just labor. In fact, I would almost say labor, if, if you're doing managed services correctly, labor is one of the smallest costs that you have to deliver because like all of the management stuff, uh, the alerting, the remediation, uh, you know, a well-tuned MSP is going to have all of that managed within the RMM and the PSA and the 96 other tools that they're using. However, we are talking about the smaller MSP. So we may also need to assume that maybe they don't have their tools tuned as well. Yeah. But they still have a lot of tools. Sure, sure. The the way that I think about the the tool sets, and and again, you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that um, there is a there is a, a a wholesale price that I'm buying these tools from or software from, like a Pax Eight, for instance, and then I am uh, reselling that software to my client. Like I am essentially baking in a margin. Uh, based on that arbitrage from what it's costing me to what I'm selling to the client. Is that a reasonable or something? Yes, but okay. I, I guess I do want to make sure we're on the same page. Like 90% of our tools are all consumption-based. Yeah. There, there are a few where you know they've got minimums and maybe we don't meet the minimum, right? But that is still like a like a one-to-one -one ratio. For every endpoint, there's one of these agents for every user. Yeah. There's one of these things. Yeah. The problem that we see with our clients is not so much the, the margin management on individual tools. It's that those tools aren't getting bill to the client, meaning they're being provisioned, but they're not getting billed because uh, it's largely a manual reconciliation to say, oh, I've got all these Microsoft 365 software licenses. Um, am I actually billing these out to all of my clients? And there's a lot of lost revenue that occurs in that, in that gap. And to date, it's largely been a lot of manual reconciliation. Now, you probably know this or your listeners know this, but Colin Knox over at Gradient MSP uh, just launched a solution not that long ago to help automate the capturing of what is very often missed revenue. So that that might be a real that might be a real opportunity to make sure that you're not leaving margin on the floor and that you are in fact capturing the revenue that you have contractually earned. So yeah, I would say that making sure we're billing for all the things is really important. Would you say that if we are setting up our books correctly, would you say that those things should be accounted for with gross profit? Or are those not cost of goods sold? Those are more expenses. Uh, generally, the, especially if they're being consumed by the client, those would be that th those would be uh, cost of sales. So any any technology that I'm using that is driving revenue into my clients, that would be cost of sales. That would hit the gross profit line. But if I buy technology that helps me as an MSP manage my business, that that th that technology would be an expense. Or an sure. So like QuickBooks and the PSA, those could be considered expenses. Yeah. However, I even know some MSPs, um, they are baking in, I'm going to call it, they've got like a site fee for each client, right? Mm -hmm. And in that site fee, they're even like baking in some uh, additional margin to cover things like the PSA and the accounting and all of the other 
admin work that needs to happen to manage that client. And I commend them because that is as detailed. Right. So you could bake that into your per employee per month uh, standard cost and just embed that in how you price, or you could separate that out. It, some of it's cosmetic. It depends on how you want to show it and to what level of detail to your, to your clients. The reason that I brought up labor, and I, I think you're right, maybe for slightly larger MSPs that are starting to scale personnel, the reason why it becomes such a, uh, a risk factor is that in a managed service environment where you are pricing at a fixed fee, you are in effect taking risk in managing to a certain gross margin. So if I'm managing, I'm going to make this up, but if I'm managing to say a 60% gross margin, I only have so much labor cost that I can allocate or want to allocate to that account I'd like to know, am I over or under that based on how my techs are tracking time? And if I'm significantly over that, why am I over that? And how do I get back into alignment? Because I'm the one that's taking risk unless I go and renegotiate with a client. That's a really good point. So I'm trying to formulate the question. I had a good one. Man, this is happening to me more and more, Russell. <laughs> this is this this is this is this is why we can take like a pregnant pause and reflect. Moment of reflection. Yeah. 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 I uh, I've got two kids. Please don't say pregnant to me. <laughs> no more. <laughs> no more. All right. So Saying that you want to aim for a specific gross margin, is is that the right way to do this these days? The way that I look at it is so y- yes, gross margin, gross margin is your is your target, but uh, we don't live in a world of chattering about gross margin like around the office it's a little too ab- it's a little too abstract frankly mm-hmm. the way that i would think about it is something that uh is termed in the industry uh something called the shadow bill rate the shadow bill rate and the shadow bill rate basically looks like this and uh, i think i heard that shadow bill rate for the first time from larry cobrin over at msp cfo uh, we have a slightly modified calculation called the win for all ratio, but here's how it basically works. It says, listen, I'm charging a client a thousand dollars a month for my managed services based on how my team is tracking and the individual levels of, of, um, roles in the organization that are servicing that account and their effective bill rates. If they were billing hourly, they're not. If they were billing hourly, what is that ratio between what I'm charging the client divided by hours spent by my team times their effective bill rate? And if that is significantly below one, if it's below one, that's a, that's a radar up that, huh, <coughs> I'm, I, I'm not achieving a win for all with the client and our firm. So in effect, we are under, under our gross profit target, but we didn't, I didn't say anything about gross profit. I used a different metric that people can better grok. Can, can you give me that, that formula again? Yeah. Yeah. So in the numerator, you've got that per, you've got that managed service monthly rate called a thousand dollars in the denominator. You have the time by individual and level times their bill rate, times their bill rate uh, added together for everybody that's serviced that account for the month. That denominator is your effective shadow bill rate. Like if I were, but I'm not, if I were to charge that client 
hourly, I would have charged them 2000 but I have a contract with them that I, they only pay me a thousand. So what's my shadow? What's my ratio? 0.5. What's my target ratio? 1.0. Something's wrong. So I'm going to put a formula up. So for example, if I were billing uh, $1,000 a month and, uh, I did three hours of labor, right? Yeah. And I normally charge $180 an hour. Yeah. So this is basically saying I did well. Correct. Correct. Uh, and uh, however, right? Yeah, yes, well, but question, sustainable, question mark, sustainable, question mark. Because you might say, oh my gosh, like we're making so much money on this client. But is are that really, continue? yeah, like, are we going to continue? So what we do, by the way, I'm in the managed service business at Stride. I just happen to deliver bookkeeping accounting services. I have the same pricing model as MSPs. I, I charge per, per, uh, per month flat fee and I have to manage my cost. I show this data to my clients and I say, listen, we're partners. I want to have a long-term relationship with you. We manage our relationship to a 1.0 for what we call the win for all ratio. And I'm going to share all this with your audience with a, a download. They can look at all the calculations, how we do this. And if we're significantly above one, let's get back in alignment. If we're significantly below one, let's get back in alignment. So nobody's trying to do a one over on any, on anybody. We're just trying to maintain the health of a win for all. That's partnership. Okay. But I, I do want to continue the argument that what we are providing is significantly more than labor because now they don't have to pile the licenses and all the other stuff. So for us, it, it might be, uh, more like, uh, you know, we've, we've got, we've got all that, uh, labor, same, same formula basically. Right. So it's going to be 1000 divided by, uh, three hours at 180. but, uh, maybe we also have $300 in costs. You may, right. So what we're doing there on the thousand is we're, we're isolating that for, uh, wh what we're assuming is that that does not include the variable cost software or hardware that gets added to a monthly invoice based on the variable nature of those hardware and software costs. If what, so yes, whatever is included in that thousand, mm -hmm. right? What we, we would also make sure to capture it in the denominator. Most often, what we see is that software and hardware are addition to the $125 per month that I charge per employee for that client. Not always, but very often. But yes, whatever else is included in that thousand, we would put it in the denominator. I'm simplifying. Sure. So with, with this, I made a much more uh, complex equation because I love parentheses when doing math. Um, yeah. good, order of <laughs> good, good, good order of operations there. Yes. So with this equation, um, this is definitely closer to 1.0. Mm -hmm. However, would you say I need to lower the 1000 or increase what I'm doing for the client to get it even closer? Or would you be happy with 1.19? Oh, I I'd be happy with 1.19. And here's why, uh, because it's kind of like if you're a contractor building a, building a house on a fixed bid basis, you're essentially saying to the client. Uh, I'm willing to take the risk. I'm willing to take the risk. And listen, if I'm going to take the risk, I'm going to bake in a little additional safety. Sure. And so it's not uncommon to have your bar set closer to that 1.2 or 1.25. I, I say 1.0 for just simplicity purposes. But no, okay. I think like a 1.2, totally reasonable. So do you then say to your client, Here's an acceptable range. And if it falls outside this range for more than one month, 
then we need to have a conversation about what you're paying, whether it needs to go up or down. Yeah. Last month, last three months, last six months is what, what you want to track. And my recommendation would be to get on a cadence with your clients of what we call a state of the relationship call. Every quarter, you sit down and you have a state of the relationship. And in that state of the relationship, you are sharing with them, hey, what's going? You're asking them, right? What's going well on a scale of one to five? How are we doing? Oh, we're a three. What would make it a five? Um, how's our shared agreement? Like, how are we working together? Let's look at the data. Where are we on the win for all ratio? Do we need to make an adjustment? Make it data driven. Ground stories with facts. Clients love when you are able to come to the data table with objective information, just like you do with your technology, but not often with your back office data and showcase that you run a disciplined, tight organization. Their willingness to acknowledge your data as a driver of increasing price is a whole lot more readily accepted than what often happens with price negotiations. Feelings, emotions. That's usually not a great recipe. Hmm. Well, and I want to clarify, I'm sure a lot of MSPs are listening to this or watching and saying, hold on a second, you want me to go to my clients and tell them I'm charging them too much? I, I challenge you to actually figure out what your number is and, um, you know, take, take like your top three clients, figure out what your number is using that equation. Basically, whatever you're charging on the top line uh, versus whatever you're providing on the bottom line. And then um, let us know what, what the answer is for your top three clients in the comments, because I, I bet that a lot of smaller MSPs might be closer to like 0 0.75 or even lower. And that's because, um, take me for example, I just love to help people. Okay. And if I, and I also love new toys, right? So if I see software that's, that's going to like take what I do and make it better, uh, maybe it's going to, sure, it'll automate it and it'll, uh, it'll make my life easier, but maybe I wasn't even doing that thing to begin with. So now not only will it automate it for me, I'll, I'll be able to like actually check that box off. Right. Um, well, yeah, of course I'm going to sign up. I'm, I'm charging all these clients, all this money. What's another couple hundred bucks a month in another tool. And it's, it's real easy for us to say, you know, what's 50 bucks here or a hundred bucks there and all these subscriptions add up and you, you don't even realize a lot of times how much money you're spending to actually deliver service to your clients. And a lot of those things that you're signing up for are things that should be on the bottom of uh, the, what is it? The denominator, you know, whatever yeah, they're, they're things that should be in that equation that we're discussing. Yeah. Because a lot of times it's like, oh, I just signed up for total or um, uh, MSP magic to manage my, uh, my clients, Microsoft 365 mm -hmm. tenants, or maybe I just signed up for a new DNS filtering thing or, or whatever the thing is, right? You're, you're signing up for things because you care about protecting your clients. And you, you care, you care about delivering, uh, excellent services and keeping them, their data, their employees, all of that safe. And that's why you just, uh, almost negligently just randomly buy things and just start deploying them without looking at how it's actually affecting the profitability for each of your clients. And I'm not saying that everybody does it. I just know a lot of people do. 100%. And think about what it is we're trying to maximize. What we're trying to maximize is LTV, lifetime value of that customer. We want a customer 
that's going to stay with us for three to five years. Think about this. When you believe that you're entering into the kind of relationship and partnership that could sustain for three to five years, what are you able to do? You're able to pay more to acquire that customer, which means that you could put more dollars into sales and marketing if you know that you have a formula, a methodology for maintaining a three to five year relationship. And if transparency of pricing is part of that formula and you go to a a client and say, hey, I just want to make sure that we're looking at the same data, we're grounding our stories with facts, we're agreeing on the right price for the service we're providing. And that client says, oh my gosh, what an amazing partner I have. And that drives one, two, or three additional trusted referrals from that client to help you continue to drive your machine of new client acquisition. Then you're building a flywheel. Use your financial data to drive growth. This is one example of how to do it. Does that make sense? I can't hear you. Because uh, I I do this thing where uh, every episode, my goal is to keep my microphone muted so everybody is like, wait, is something wrong? <laughs> it's just what I think there's something wrong. That's <laughs> yeah. We're okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna put up your website on the bottom here. It is www.stride.services. Um, if, if you guys like what you hear from Russell, he's, he's a really smart dude, right? Um, that's why I invited him here. I hope to invite him here again and hopefully frequently because this is the type of stuff that I think all of you MSP business owners need to know. And, um, Hey, if you can afford it. Hire this guy. Russell, what's it, what's it like to hire you? Oh, it's a dreamy. It's dreamy to hire Stride. Um, well, what's it, what's it like? So here, here's what I would say. Um, I want to be a guide for smaller MSPs that are, on, that are on their path to clearing a million to million and a half in revenue. And when I say I want to be a guide, meaning I want to be available to answer questions, to provide content, uh, maybe have a, a consultation with one of our CFOs. We even created this free diagnostic called the power meter for MSPs, where you can self-assess how well you're using your financial information today. And maybe we could put that into the show notes, Steve. So the more that I can do to be an ally and guide for you, no, uh, no contractual arrangement here, no payment required, the better I'm going to feel. Because most, most of our clients, uh, we're going to be most impactful when you're at about the 1.2 to 1.5 million in revenue and up. Because when we come to the party, we come to the party with a lot of process, a lot of discipline, a a team-based approach to delivering the service. We're We're at a point where you look at Stride and say, they are my, they are my accounting team. Full stack, right? Expenses, payroll, regulatory, compliance. They close my books. They present my financials. They help me build my forecast. That's a lot of horsepower. Mm -hmm. And that's typically appropriate when you're, when you've crossed that million to to million and a half dollar chasm. So until then, let's, let's build a relationship and let me help you. And I'm, I'm going to throw a curveball at you. How would you feel about, uh, being, available in the rocket msp community we've got a a discord community chat you you are willing to hang out in there and chat whenever people ask questions yeah reserve reserve me a seat i'd love to come to the party and just be be a part of the community and help where help where i can i think uh, what i've loved about entering into the msp world is that sense of community and collaboration and partnership and I think we have something special to offer and I just want to be available. That's fantastic. I really appreciate it. So I, I started doing this new thing, uh, where I, I start bringing up this fun music 
And uh, that's that's our cue. And you know the the best part about this music, I just I just found it. It's it's built in the Streamyard. Nice. I didn't really like go looking for it. I wasn't like what music defines me. Yeah, but I like it. It kind of gets me moving a little too. Yeah. And and it's cool to see like how your guests react to the music. Right? You learn a little something about that. Yeah. So so I challenge you guys, leave a comment uh either in in the Discord community uh in the general chat room or in the comments to this video or podcast. Let us know what are your top three clients? What is it? Win ratio? Win for all. Win for all ratio. Win for all ratio. Are you above 1.0 or below or just really close? Because um, we need to get you close if, if you're below. That's for sure. Probably awesome. should have probably should have worded that differently. But it already happened. This is happening. <laughs> this, this is this is this is this is the moment. This is uh-huh. living in the moment. It sure is. All right. Well, Russell, thanks so much. Stick around. Um, but thanks so much, and uh, I will catch you guys on the next episode.